Hi, my name is Kate and welcome to our channel. Today I'm going to have a conversation with Dr. Kendall Tuckett. She is a health psychologist and also international board certified lactation consultant. She won a lot of awards for her work, uh, edited or authored 38 books and her most recent books are The Depression of New Moms, third edition, and The Woman's Mental Health Across the Lifespan. And I hope you will enjoy our conversation, and if so, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share it with your friends. How usually women describe their birth experiences if it was disrespectful or traumatic in terms of emotions and feelings how does it actually feel like so people who are watching us could relate and maybe think oh yes that resonates with me and maybe i, right. I really need to address this yeah I mean, it's amazing actually over the years how many women i've talked to who've had horrendous birth experiences and i also have like talked to a lot of providers who were witnesses to those birth experiences they were like either doulas or nurses and they couldn't do anything about it and so it traumatizes them as well but yeah, the, you know, fe being frightened, um, feeling like everybody's taking, you know, your control out of your hands, not feeling like you're consulted on any decision, um, feeling like you're, you know, betrayed by your providers, uh, sometimes probate, you know, betrayed by your partners, by your, even your own body. Uh, those are really kind of common feelings. The betrayal, the sadness, the sorrow, all of those things are really common reactions to a difficult birth, but also, you know, some women have kind of almost more of a post-traumatic stress reaction. Actually, I first wrote about that in 1992. And at that time, you couldn't even diagnose PTSD after birth because they have in the PTSD diagnosis something called um, the event criteria. And so they were talking about things like the Holocaust and sexual assault and combat. And so the diagnosis at that time was you had to have experienced something outside the range of normal human experiences. Obviously, birth doesn't fit. But, you know, it was amazing when I was working on the very first edition of my postpartum depression book. Uh, I was interviewing women and they'd say, oh, my depression was all caused by home moms. And then they go on to tell me the most horrific birth experiences. And I'm kind of like, I don't think that that's just your hormones. I think that you had a really traumatic experience. And, you know, I could actually line up. I'd say, okay, so these are the dimensions of PTSD. And these are the stories that women have said. You know, it fits. This fits. You know, and so I wrote that back in, in 1992. And so one of the really common reactions is like the replaying of the event over and over and over again. You know, it just runs like a tape, you know, and, and I hear mothers say that all the time. I just can't shut this off, you know, and it just kind of turns your world upside down in some ways. You know, that's what a lot of mothers have told me that they've experienced. You know, I remember talking to a mom one time and she was, she had become a mom at, a, you know, an older age, you know, sort of probably early 40s, but she had been you know, a real high flyer in the finance world, traveling all around the world and, you know, just making all these deals, making lots of money. And her birth basically turned her world upside down. She actually couldn't even imagine that she was going to be able to go on and life would not be the same, you know. But then she said to me, she goes, well, you know, you had a difficult birth and you seem to be okay. And I said, yeah, I am okay. And you will be okay too. But right now, this is just hard, you know, to walk through this. And so, yeah, a lot of times the trauma reaction is really common. You know, one thing that's kind of important to know is like when you're in the situation where you're giving birth, your oxytocin levels are at the highest that they are pretty much in your life, that in an immediate postpartum. Okay. One of the things that oxytocin does, and we could consider this a good thing, but you can also see there's a downside to it, is it gives you the ability to sort of read social cues. You know, because if you think about it, that's going to be super helpful with a baby, right? You know, if you can kind of figure out who your baby, so you can kind of see why it happens. But what also happens is they're very vulnerable because they pick up all the nonverbal stuff and you might say all the right things, but they're picking it up. And so like, let's say you couldn't find a parking spot, you know, or had a fight with your husband and you come in and you've got this, all this energy around you. They might think it's directed toward them. You know, so they're vulnerable during that time. So even if people weren't trying to be mean, they're very vulnerable. But yeah, so, you know, the, 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 the things that, you know, are a lot of times that follow, you know, the depression or feeling like you just can't do this. You're just going to, you're having a hard time being a mother or you're replaying these events over and over and over again. You know, um, these are all really common reactions. And if we talk about uh, short term um, consequences, let's say, uh, of and the effects of this 
Uh, and sometimes we are not talking about like really traumatic birth experiences, meaning like uh, death life situation. Sometimes right. it's really like disrespectful and, you know, oh, yeah. diminishing women in, in, in many ways, yep. etc. So it, it shouldn't be something super critical to feel bad, actually, and to feel nope. like disrespected and feel something. As you said, well, like you pick up this really small cues. There was a nice literature review that um, was published a couple of years ago, and they looked at all the different factors that could be related to birth. And, you know, so many providers kind of will put this on mothers. They'll say, well, you know, she has really unrealistic expectations or they just need to trust us, you know, to take care of it. I mean, which is so ridiculous because, you know, so much of other healthcare is moving into that whole, you know, that the, the, the parent and the healthcare provider are, are partners in the, or the patient and the healthcare provider are partners in, and, you know, kind of, you know, informed consent and all this stuff. That all goes out the window in birth. It really, really does. And again, like I said, sometimes it could just be one rude remark or one mishandling. And, you know, then of course that, that kind of ramps up. And so, yeah, you're in a very vulnerable state there. And so it's like, it doesn't take a lot, you know, but then there's these egregious samples and examples. And the fact that that is still going on and still happens to me is just amazing. So when we're talking about the short-term and long-term effects of these experiences, what are the most common of them? So again, people could potentially recognize themselves and seek for help mm. and, you know. I would say depression and anxiety are, are the two most common. You know, you can get post-traumatic stress symptoms and then, you know, on the more extreme end is post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, so you can have symptoms of trauma without necessarily having a PTSD diagnosis. And those would be things like that hypervigilance and that, you know, reoccurring, they call it the reoccurring criteria, which is when things, you know, play in your mind over and over and over again and run this tape, um, you know, inability to sleep, you know. And so the, this is really concerning to me when you got a mom who's like, you know, everybody's asleep, including the baby, and she's up at two o'clock in the morning writing thank you notes. You know, it's kind of like that to me is a worrisome symptom. Uh, so these are kind of common things, but, you know, with any trauma, Depression is actually the most common. Mm -hmm. How some someone could recognize these depression si signals? Because I still hear, maybe this is the community that I'm living here in, but I, I can still hear the stories when women really feel themselves at some edge with the child. Like, you know, this feeling that you're holding the child and you're feeling like you're on the edge and you probably want to do something crazy. So, but how can someone start to recognize that something is wrong earlier than when you're already on the edge holding this baby and you, you're not sure what you're going to do next? I, you know, there's a lot of um, scales, you know, the assessment tools that mothers can use. The most common is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, but um, that one's a little tricky because the language is kind of colloquial British English. And so sometimes that fit doesn't connect. The one I like the most is a, it's a screening scale. It's called the, the Patient Health Questionnaire 4. It's two depression questions and two anxiety questions. And that is a pretty good indicator. Okay, you know, like if you score on that and you score high, that's probably okay, we need to follow up. But I would say like for individual mothers, I would say, you know, if you're really, if you're worried about it or if you're, you know, a partner or a friend or a parent of somebody that you're worried about, I said, look one of those up online and, and have the mother complete them because they will give you an idea of, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And we definitely put them in the comments under the videos. So the links, uh, you, you will be able to find them on the, co in the, in the description of the video. So for people to, for easier search, let's say. Yeah. I think actually the, that would be a good place to start, I think. But, you know, especially if you start feeling like, you know, oh, I just can't do this. I'm the worst mother in the world. You know, the really concerning ones are kind of, I think this baby would be better off without me. I mean, that's very concerning. We want to make sure that, you know, she gets some kind of attention from that. You know, the problem is, you know, a lot of the providers are still not quite there in terms of knowing what to do. You know, if moms report depression, I mean, he, here even in my community, it was about four or five years ago, um, there were a couple of mothers who told their physicians, hey, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm feeling kind of depressed. And they called child protection on, on them. I mean, nightmare. You know, it was ridiculous. I, I actually couldn't believe they did that. But it's kind of like, unfortunately, sometimes the medical system isn't quite there. They're trying. They're getting there. But it's like, that may not be the best place. I'd probably be looking more in for community support to start. 
Um, but the nice thing is there's lots and lots and lots of options that help you treat depression. So it's not just, you know, we diagnose you and you put you on medications. There's many, many, many ways that are very effective to treat depression. And so that is actually, I think, the very good news. And so there really is something for everyone. So, and that brings me to the next question. So uh, what would be, let's say, like three simple steps that you would recommend anyone who finds themselves in this uh, depressive state? Uh, we don't know if there is any diagnosis yet or anything, but the, right, right. yes. So what would be the, the probably three first actions that somebody needs to take uh, in that situation? If you know if I could come up with necessarily three, I would say probably the first one would be to talk to somebody you trust. You know, and if you don't feel like you get a satisfactory answer, because sometimes people don't know how to handle this, talk to somebody else. But find a community, you know, and maybe look online, kind of see what resources are in your community. You know, because there's even some like online groups and there's mental health practitioners that can help, um, you know, with uh, with counseling, even online. I mean, that's one of the thing that COVID did is it really kind of opened up the possibilities for that. So even sometimes if there's not somebody in your community, so I would say probably reach out. I would say educate yourself about it. And educate yourself particularly about what are some things to do that can help. And then I see that maybe the last one would be to get some support because oftentimes you find that the mothers are very isolated and they can't seem to kind of like get anybody to kind of help, you know, and just even to have a time, you know, for somebody to hold the baby so you can go take a shower, you know, sometimes even just getting something that simple. And so trying to kind of reach out and find some type of support, I think that that's really important. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And I feel that, you know, it's it's really important to prepare in advance because one, you, you're already in the heat of the situation and you already have a baby and you're really underslept, overwhelmed, everything going on together, you're by yourself. It's not a best place to start. So if there is a possibility in your life to, you know, during the birth, prepare some sort of a, team community people around you who are going to help you just you know wash the dishes uh, but, to, but to be on the other you know on the other hand that's probably not going to be the group that's going to get depressed who did that you know and so a lot of times the moms i'm working with are the ones who just all of a sudden find themselves in this you know because even if you try to kind of educate moms prenatally about this you know and and their partners you know if you try to in pre, you know in childbirth education or something try to tell them hey look this could be a possibility um they never think it's going to be them. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh no, that's not going to happen to me. And so it kind of surprises people. And they've, they've actually done some studies where they do stuff like, you know, if they give mothers a handout, you know, in the hospital, does that help? No, not really. Um, it does kind of like it helped them reach out. So that part's good. It doesn't prevent it though. Um, so the reaching out, and I think actually the more ways to reach out, you know, to mothers, I think the better. I, I noticed one of our local hospitals here, uh, they've actually started doing something kind of nice. They give these appointment cards that are like this big. And on the back, it's kind of like, here's the number to get help. You know, we, we our women, infant and children place where, the you know, you can get supplemental food and stuff. Um, and they have this number for, you know, and they have basically resource numbers on, on their appointment cards. You know, and I thought, that's actually really good. I think that that's actually really good. You know, so the more kind of channels that, that communities can hit to kind of make sure that there's that support available. And, you know, some of it comes down to kind of educating. And like you said, the mother sometimes is overwhelmed. So maybe it's her friend who finds the information for her or her partner or her mother, you know, uh, but somebody kind of can dig into that. But I think probably the first step is to just say something. And again, you may not get a good answer the first time, you know, but keep trying until you do.